Joining us this afternoon is Mr. Josh Gerls with your moderator. Jonathan Dix. Jonathan Dix. Thank you very much and welcome back. We're glad to reopen the Crescent for you. A nice warm Illinois afternoon. So thank you for that warm welcome there. So we have your Josh Gerls. Uh, now, you're not a stranger to Cornerstone Festival, correct? No. So how, how do you like it here? Is it, is it better than normal? Um, I don't know. This year, um, each year it seems ask me to play at new stages so as long as there's something new going on it keeps it fresh so i'm having a, a good time so. now you're playing you played at mayfish last night during their 25th anniversary was that yep. a lot of fun it was yeah did you and and then tonight you're playing the gallery at 6 p.m will there be any surprise is anything unusual um probably about half new songs i have um, been working all year on a new album and so it's exciting to play new songs i know Last year, I think as an artist, I was playing songs that I've been playing for a few years, and inside it uh, felt kind of anticlimactic. And so this year, I'm actually excited to be on gallery and introduce new songs. So, yeah. Now, I know you have the new album. The new album that you said is what, coming out next month? Next month, yeah. Finally. People have been waiting for that, I think. Yeah. What's the title going to be? It's uh, Jack Aranda. Jack Aranda? Yeah. What does that mean? Uh, Jack Aranda is. Uh, kind of a tropical tree. My wife grew up in Peru, South America. Um, her folks were Wycliffe missionaries. Her dad was a bush pilot. They got a bunch of cool stories, but um, one of the songs on the album is called Jack Around the Tree. My wife wrote all the words to that, and there's a line that says, I'll be a Jack Around the Tree in Indiana, greenhouse, and sung to, meaning she's going to be kind of this tropical tree that will come uh, to be with me here in the Midwest. And so this last 10 months, we've been in this old house on a river uh, creating this album together so we thought it was fitting that we're kind of in this greenhouse creating songs so uh, yeah so we decided to call it Jacaranda and we just really like the word so so she was a missionary kid in, in Peru South America in uh, Amazon so is that where you get a lot of the is that where you get some of the Afro-Caribbean hip-hop I don't know Probably more influenced, yeah, by hip hop and then following those roots down um, through the ages and the like old Delta blues and then realizing that comes from a lot of West African rhythms. And so, probably more following the trail of hip hop and soul music way back to its origins and yeah, and then infusing that with folk music and everything else. So, why not? Someone I, I read somewhere it was described, you were described as surf infused pop, Afro Caribbean hip hop, and Southern spirituals. Quite, quite a blend of, of different things. Um, so, how did you end up on a surf, how did your music end up getting used on a surf documentary? Um, I tried to trace it back. Can you guys hear out there? Is, is the sound level okay? Okay. Um, let's see. I think just in the last few years, surf culture, I grew up skateboarding in the Midwest, so it's been kind of strange that all of a sudden there's been this big embrace of uh, the music on the coast, especially in surf culture. This one guy, Russell Brownlee, has been using my music in documentaries he's been doing for probably the last four or five years, and uh, has a lot of friends who make documentaries, so everyone he meets, he passes my music on to, and most recently it got used in this kind of bigger surf documentary called Walking on Water, where they take these two little surf grommets all around the world, Kind of like endless summer, they go to the nicest surf spots in the world, um, Indonesia and South Africa and all these spots, surfing with pros, but also seeing how people in those areas are living and seeing how the large the body of Christ is around the world. So it's a pretty multifaceted film, with pretty good cinematography and whatnot. And um, they ended up using a handful of my songs. So it was, really, it was really a blessing. I got to tour with them up the East Coast and open up with a few songs for the documentary, so it was really, really fun. Learned to surf along the way too, so. You enjoy surfing now? I enjoy it, I'm not good at it, but. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's different than skating when you have a, something moving underneath you that's pushing you, uh, this force that's not static, it's, it's movement, and so mostly I get thrown on my head a lot, but, you know. Must be fun to do when you, when you, when, if you get to tour the coast. Yeah. Um, I know if you, you're described as a mystic Christian. Uh, I've seen that online. So how, how would you say, is that, you know, is that a description you really like? Or is that a good enough descriptive title? I think, 
actually after that interview got put out, which is about a guy who doesn't believe, but was into the music, and that was his way of describing what I'm doing, and he found it really interesting the way I chose to describe things of the faith. You know, and this is a guy who doesn't believe, and he chose to call me a mystic Christian. Then it's strange, some of the delineations and word wars within the subculture of Christianity, because I got some emails, people saying, I researched what mystic means, and it sounds like it's off base, or heretical, or unorthodox, or, you know, so there's that weird tension when the fact is that I really believe in the power of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit being part of the Trinity and the living, moving power that He leads us into and the fact that He said the Spirit will teach us all things. Um, and so I rely on, on the Spirit to open up in Revelation things that our human minds can't understand on our own and to open up impossible paths that we in and of ourselves can't open that door and so even a lot of my subject matter on the last album and then into this one is about kind of voyaging into the unknown with faith that the lord the spirit will show us the way as we go rather than having it all hammered out and having a systematic theology that we can prove anyone wrong with i, I think um a walk with god is much more breathing and moving um, and that really scares some people, I think. And, but that's part of, I think, what I talk about in my music is the fact that this thing's pretty unknown and mysterious and, in a sense, mystical because we're voyaging into the unknown on faith that this God we have is good and will lead us each step along the way like the children in the desert, you know? So in that sense, I guess I am. There's a long history of mystic Christians, but it's not uh, It's not like a, a banner I'm going to put on my forehead or something. Well, I, I think Paul writes about how we, we see things through a you know through a dark glass. We don't we don't see things clearly yet. So there's a lot we really don't know or really or that we just can't understand yet. Um, but how much uh, you know how much someone else said or I was looking at some of the comments you got on, on an interview and someone says you're really too Christian in your music. And that hurts your your overall influence to to like you could be you could be bigger than you are if you weren't as Christian. And uh, but but that's not who you are, I would think. Um, do do you think being a Christian musician hurts the fact that people won't listen to your music? Oh well, no! Right when I started believing, when I was about 19 years old, there was immediately, I guess what you call a crossroads right then where. Uh, I kind of had an inner sense of, wow, these, so these sounds I'm playing with could have the potential to um, win a lot of ears and be palatable to a whole lot of people. But on the same token, um, this life change I've had that like, I'm like now owned by the Lord and I know that I'm even told to like sing praises to Him, that's not going to be palatable to very many people. And so is this crossroads if I could... I could compromise what I think I have to say in um, preference of these sounds that I know will be palatable with hip-hop backbeats and kind of funky acoustic stuff, um, but at the same token knowing that um, I think every artist the Lord treats a little differently and that's something I believe. I think some uh, are made to be much more poetic and even ambiguous to make people um, think and come to the conclusions on their own, then I think we do have artists that the Lord calls to be pro prophets and say things that are going to offend and to, to say the things that some people aren't going to appreciate at all. And I don't know where I lie totally, but I know that there are times that if I try to write a lyric and I know that I'm covering something up and I, I can feel it in my spirit, I feel that I think I'm doing this to make listeners happy rather than to bring the song where I think it needs to go. And I try my best to choose where I feel the sound of the lyric needs to go. Um, and sometimes I think that's not palatable to people, you know? Um, I mean, I think within the Christian culture, you'll have people nodding their heads in approval, but it, at times it can be a detriment to um, having some critical acclaim you know, so I guess you just gotta hold that loosely. If, if people dig it, they dig it. If they don't, they don't. But I, I try to be uh, sincere with what I think I'm supposed to be saying in any given song or album, you know? So, yeah, so there's been a, a choice to do that along the way. It's been a tension though, for sure. Uh, now, you said your, your, your wife wrote a song in the new album. Is, is the rest of it all yours? 
Have you, did you have, uh, I don't know how much of a band you really have or a group of musicians you work with. So it's just kind of how your, if uh, any kind of rhyming or your music making process is like, kind of like a, a collaborative effort with anyone else or, or how do you, how do you structure that? Um, I mean, you, you sometimes you hear a rhythm somewhere and then you think of something that could go along with that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. How, how do you create a song? Almost always with a melody first, and then a melody will have a color or a emotion or feeling or memory attached to it for me, and then words will start to cling themselves to the melody. So usually a, a melody, and then the words will come, and then additional stuff that I might add, harmonies, whatever, to kind of bolster the feeling uh, that I'm trying to get from that song. Uh, this new album, my wife actually we work really closely together, like definitely most of the songwriting and instrumental work and recording and engineering, like I do all that. Yet, she's kind of become my creative teammate. She did all the art, wrote lyrics for a few of the songs, and even sings on one song that we made for our daughter. Um, kind of um, unexpectedly have formed this team and putting out projects together. I think we realized when we got married in a month and a half and we had to like put together this whole wedding in a month and a half, which is a lot of work, we realized we worked well as a team. And so even now with these projects, they become kind of our full-time work of tackling the, the art and uh, songwriting and sound together. So, but mostly me and her, my buddy Jay Kirkpatrick, who's been working with me for a while, is the main musician I worked with. He's on about 10 of the 15 songs but as far as a full band like I had on my last album, this one's much more me um, at home working with samples and pulling out digital sounds and then adding acoustic stuff on top. So probably as far as instrumentation and accompaniment, much more solo on this one. So, uh, so like in a live show, are you also playing, uh, what kind of instruments are you using? Are you playing some background text with certain sounds or, or samples in the background when you're playing live? Yeah, I've always liked to use samples. Um, so with this new album, there will be samples live. I got a new sampler that I actually bring it with my foot so I can do uh, like beat breaks and stuff, which is kind of nice because up until now, I've been using a sampler at my side that I bring in um, the layers one on top of another. But I've been using a, a foot sampler and playing around with different instruments. Uh, tonight, I'll be using this little South American instrument called the charango. Um, if you've seen the Motorcycle Diaries, it's a really good movie about Che Guevara before he became, you know, the revolutionary or whatever. Um, but the whole soundtrack's done by Gustavo Santolaya on this little South American instrument called the Charango, and it's so beautiful. And so I thought I had to have one, and I, I ordered one from uh, Bolivia and learned to play it. And um, a few of the songs on the album are with this little beautiful instrument, and I'll play one tonight. Mostly though, live, I, yeah, I gravitate to acoustic guitar, beats, sometimes other instruments. It gets hard to travel with a lot of instruments, but when it comes to recording, I love to just accumulate all types of little sound makers and banjos and borrow slide guitars and everything else and see what sounds I can kind of squeak out of these instruments that I don't usually know how to play up front, but figure out as best I can, so, yeah. I wanted to say, if any, if any of the audience have a question, just go to the sound booth. There's a microphone back there, and we'll try and get to get to you here in a second. So, do you ever feel sometimes when you when you do make so many layers on a on on a song that it's going to be hard to play live? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times, I'll just choose live. Live will just be a, almost like a different version of the song, stripped down, just me and acoustic guitar, even like stripped down the samples to just the most basic elements. Um, otherwise, like Sufjan Stevens, I saw him play a few months before he just blew up, you know? Yeah, man. And um, he's playing for like 20 people at Taylor University in Indiana, which is this yeah. little rural, this little rural university, just him and his banjo, you know? And I've been listening to these songs on the Michigan album that have, you know, xylophones and trumpets and stuff. But because there's not necessarily a, he couldn't afford to travel with the amount of musicians he would need to totally present those songs but then you know as this um, album illinois just blows up all of a sudden you go to see him in kentucky this sold out arena and he's got 15 people on stage and trombones and so in some ways i really some artists are really strict about whatever we record we have to be able to do it live and i'm 
I don't fall in that camp. To me, um, recordings, you want to be able to perform what's recorded, mostly like the, the heart of it vocally, but I don't feel married to a recording in such a way that I need to perform it that way live all the time. I'm, if you want to hear it that way, you can listen to the CD, but live almost is nice to do something different. So a lot of times the recorded piece in my mind is different than the performance piece, if that makes sense. If one day I could travel with 15 musicians though, <laughs> I'll have like the horn section and you know all of that. Until then, it'll probably be me and a guitar and a sampler. But um, yeah, I was wondering if the the hip hop folk fusion that we all hear you do now is that the first kind of music that sort of came out of you, or were there some other genres that you dabbled in along the path to to what you do now? Yeah, there've been a lot of a lot of genres. I think in as I've reached an older age, older age being my 20s, um, music taste is like splintered in every direction. When I was younger, I, I had a punk rock band when I started skateboarding, and at that point in my life, all I would listen to was like punk rock, you know what I mean? Operation Ivy and Bad Religion. And like, God forbid you would listen to anything that had like a BPM less than like 180 or something, you know, it was just punk rock. And then almost overnight, started smoking buds, and all of a sudden, hip hop was like all I wanted to listen to. Wu Tang Clan and Nas, and that's God forbid I would listen to anything that wasn't East Coast underground hip hop, you know. And that was it for like five years, and that's all the music I would make was hip hop. And then got to college, and that first year in college was like the pivotal experience with me, with the Lord. And it was really strange. I came to faith and. All of a sudden realized I really love to sing, but I still love these beats, but I loved world music and folk and all these influences. And it was almost, I don't know how to describe this, but I'll try. Um, musically, I think like strict genres can almost be like, uh, we can make it in the law, if that makes any sense at all. Especially I think when you're younger, it can be this really constricting, set of rules of if you like a certain type of music what you need to look like and the lingo you need to have and if you can say the right coupling of bands you've really arrived because you have good taste in that strict genre and i lived that way very much so and then i came into faith and it was almost like i died to the law of music and i was able to just voyage out into any sound that was pleasing to me which is really liberating you know to be able to i want to sing in a falsetto with this weird little instrument on this song and the next one i want to had a beat with a banjo or something and to not feel like I had to have rules when it came to music and so um, yeah to answer your question I feel like the fusion of the things I'm doing came kind of coinciding with coming into the faith and feeling the freedom to not be bound by a subculture or a subgenre if that makes sense so since you, since you mentioned a couple times, I wanted to ask, uh, you said you went to college and you and you became a Christian while you were in college. Was there something special that happened there or or, or, or how, how did that come about, your conversion? Um, I've never, before that, I've never really been to church per se, um, or any of like established religion. And my sister, Gayla, kind of had this radical conversion herself. Um, she's a visual artist and was pretty prideful and haughty in her like uh, aesthetic and artistic culture and God just kind of like uh, flipped her life upside down. It was so obvious to me being her younger brother, you know, and then I went to Ball State where she was teaching art and she would invite me to come to this particular church on Sunday mornings and I would go in drunk or hungover uh, for like nine months it took for this to make sense but um, the songs would make me cry and the words spoken always felt like they were like someone was reading my mail and directed right at my heart and I would have to deal with that and it took about nine months and then finally like broke down and so that was it you know um, that first year just I don't know, right time, right place, right person inviting me to know the Lord, you know? So that was my experience. And yeah, it's been different life ever since then, so, yeah. Well, I think we're kind of running out of time, but I want to say thank you for Josh for coming out and for opening up the press set for us today. Again, everybody, thank you to, say thank you to Josh Taylor. Thanks, guys, thanks for coming out.
Josh Reynolds, ladies and gentlemen, your host, John Dix. Thanks so much, Josh, for being here. We appreciate it so much.